Hi, I'm Randy Appel and I'm your region tutor. And in this lesson, you're going to be learning everything you need to know for the regions on acids and bases. Now, before I can even talk about acids and bases, I need to talk about one thing. I need to talk about an electrolyte. An electrolyte is a substance that, when placed in water, conducts electricity. So anytime you put an electrolyte in water, it conducts electricity. Now, the reason it conducts electricity is because when you put it in water, it breaks up into its ions. Now, ions, when they're free-flowing and moving around, conduct electricity. That's what conducts electricity, positive and negative charges. Now, to learn more about what an ion is, go back to the concept on ion. But that's what happens when you put an electrolyte in water. There are strong electrolytes, and then there are weak electrolytes. The strong electrolytes are the substance that, when put in water, break up into many more ions. They actually break up completely. Weak electrolytes may break up a little bit, but not completely, so the amount of dissolved ions is more for a strong electrolyte than it is for a weak electrolyte. And one of the, sometimes they say, which of the following substances is the best electrolyte? What you have to do, sometimes it refers to table F. Now you remember table F, go back to the concept on table F to learn more about it and how you figure out solubility, but if it's soluble, that means it breaks up into its ions. So if it's soluble, it breaks up into its ions, which makes it an electrolyte. If it's insoluble, there aren't as many ions, it's not an electrolyte. Stro now, acids, bases, and salts are the three types of electrolytes. Acids, bases, and salts. What makes a stronger acid from a weaker acid? Again, acids break up into more ions if they're stronger than if they're weaker. Bases, same deal. If you break up into more ions, you're a stronger electrolyte. Salts as well. Now, let's first talk about salts. Salts, as you know, are ionic compounds. You need to know more about that? Click on the ionic concept, ionic, ionic bonding concept, and you learn more about that. But anything that's ionic has ions. But when they're together, they don't conduct electricity. When you put them in water, they break up into their ions, so they conduct electricity. So salts are ionic compounds positive and negative ion. Acids. Acids, the way you recognize an acid is an acid start with the letter H. So HCl is hydrochloric acid. All, also, another way to tell if it's an acid is it ends in COOH. That's, an exception, that's one of the exceptions. If you look on table K, all the acids you need to worry about are here. They don't, the regions pretty much tells you all the acids you're going to need to worry about. And look, they all start with an H. See, CO2 could be written as aqu aqueous, but it really it's the same thing as that. Unless it ends in COOH, and that's an organic acid, which we'll talk more about later on. So anything that starts with an H, you know is an acid. Except for water, obviously, because H2O is water. Now you need to know properties of acids, and there are a couple of properties. The first property you need to know about is taste. Well, you'd never taste an acid to determine whether it's an acid or not, but acids happen to have a sour taste. You may be saying, how do chemists know that acids have sour tastes? They know, you ever have lemon juice, orange juice? There's citric acid in those substances, and they're sour. Acids, another property of acids, is that they are electrolytes. When you put them in water, they break up into ions. Now, if they have H, they always have an H plus ion, and then whatever they're bonded with. So if it's HCl, they break up into H plus and Cl minus. So they're electrolytes. The other thing is, and we're going to talk more about this later, is they undergo neutralization reactions. Neutralization is the process by which you mix an acid with a base to get a salt and a water. So if you mix an acid and a base, one of the properties of acids is that it mixes with a base to produce a salt and a water. And we'll talk more about neutralization later on in this lesson. Another property of acids is that they react with certain metals to produce hydrogen gas. Now the way you tell, this is all a single replacement reaction. If you forgot what single replacement reactions were, go to the concept on single replacement reactions. But what happens is, if you have a metal reacting with an acid, remember all acids start with H. So if you have a metal reacting with an acid to determine whether or not it will react with the acid to produce hydrogen gas, you go to table J. Now you can see on your slide window, table J shows the metallic characteristics of metals. You also see H2 on the bottom. Any metal that's above hydrogen on table J 
will replace the acid, will react with the HC, the, if it's HCl, for example, let's say you have zinc plus HCl. Zinc is higher than hydrogen. Therefore, zinc is more reactive than hydrogen. So zinc will replace hydrogen in a single replacement reaction to produce hydrogen gas. So you have zinc plus HCl yields H2, because hydrogen gas is a diatomic molecule. If you need to know more about diatomic molecules, click on that concept. Produces H2 plus zinc chloride. So a rule is any metal that's above hydrogen on table J will replace it and produce hydrogen gas. The other thing is acids cause indicators to change color. Now there's table M down here, which we're going to talk about a little later, and they talk about common acid base indicators. Now when you're dealing with common acid base indicators, we're going to learn a couple of rules to deal with them. But for right now, you need to know that acids turn acid base indicators different color. And you refer to table M. Those are acids. Bases are any substance that ends with OH. Now there's one exception to this. The exception is if it has carbon in it, it can't be a base. So any substance that ends in OH other than a substance with carbon will be a base. And you come over here to table L and you see four bases. They list. Now NH3, it doesn't have an OH in it, but what happens is when you put it in water, it becomes NH3OH. But you don't need to worry too much about that. You just need to know that anything that ends in an OH is a base unless it has carbon attached to it. Now, there are other properties of bases. The first, the taste. Bases taste bitter. They also have a slippery or soapy feeling. Two properties of bases. They're also electrolytes, which we talked about, so they break up into ions. They also undergo neutralization reactions, but instead they react with acids to produce salt and water. And again, we'll talk more about neutralization later on in this lesson. And also, bases like acids on table M cause acid base indicators to change color. And again, we'll talk more about table M in a little bit. And you understand table K lists the acids, and table L lists the common bases. Now, there are certain theories of acids and bases. The theory you need to know about more than any other theory is called the Arrhenius theory. Students see those, that term and they get freaked out. There's nothing scary about Arrhenius. In fact, the Arrhenius questions on the regions are so easy. An Arrhenius acid, let's do acids first, is any substance that when placed in water produces H plus as the only positive ion in solution. It's the, an Arrhenius acid is any substance that when placed in water produces H plus, because acids have H, as the only positive ion in solution. That's all you need to know. Let's say you take HCl, hydrochloric acid, you put it in water. It produces H plus and Cl minus ions. And the only thing in the water is hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is positive. The only positive ion in an aqueous solution is H plus, the hydrogen ion. One thing that gets a little tricky about the Rhenius acids is something called the hydronium ion. When H plus gets put in water, H plus plus H2O produces H3O plus, because there's H2O with two H's, plus an H plus, which gives another H, and a charge, gives you H3O plus. That's the hydronium ion. And if you're really not sure whether the, what the hydronium ion is, go to reference table E and look it up. It's on reference table E. The hydronium ion is H3O+. Plus. What you have to know about hydronium ion is that it's, this, it's basically an H plus in water. So we could say H plus or H3O+, plus, and it means the same thing when we're talking about an Arrhenius acid. So an Arrhenius acid is any substance that when placed in water produces H plus or H3O+, plus, as the only positive ion in solution. An Arrhenius base is any substance that when placed in water produces, you don't know, OH minus as the only negative ion in solution. So you come to the bases here, NaOH, you put in water, OH minus is the only negative ion and that's the hydroxide ion. Are you going to get confused between hydroxide and hydronium? 
Well, if you do, go to table E. On the reference table, table E, list the polyatomic ions. Note that H3O plus is the hydronium ion, and that refers to acids. And OH minus is the hydroxide ion, and that refers to base. And if they ask questions, which of the following is an Arrhenius base? They're just looking for the one with the OH. Which of the following is an Arrhenius acid? They're just looking at the one that starts with an H or ends in COOH. Same deal. Same rules. And remember, for bases, if it has carbon in it, it can't be a base. So CH3OH is not a base. And that's one of the common ones they do put on the regions to trick you. CH3OH is actually an alcohol, and you'll learn about that in the organic chemistry section. That's the Arrhenius acid base theory. And then sometimes you have to know different alternate theories of acids and bases. And one theory, they call it the Bronsted-Lowry theory. You don't even have to know the name. What you need to know is that sometimes acids can act as H plus donors. And an H plus just represents a proton. So acids could be proton or H plus donors. And bases can act as H plus or proton acceptors. And that's just an alternate theory. Just memorize that, and then you're all set. Next thing I want to talk about is the pH scale. The pH scale represents a certain range of pH values. And it really refers to the concentration of the hydrogen ion. So which do you think would have, a, which do you think would have more hydrogen ion, an acid or a base? An acid, because there's more hydrogen ions in an acid. So when you put these substances in water, you can test their pH. Now the pH scale goes from 1 to 14. And you can see on the slide the pH scale. Under 7 represents an acid. Above 7 represents a base. 7 represents neutral. Now comparing H plus to OH minus, pH actually stands for the negative log of the H plus ion concentration. That's just what it means. And the only reason I'm telling you that is because a pH of 1 is actually the strongest acid because it actually contains the most H plus ions. Even though it's the smallest number, when you're dealing with logs, it gets a little tricky. We can go over that in the chat. It's way too complicated for the regions. So I'm just going to tell you that a low pH represents more acidic substance. Now, when you're comparing the H plus concentration to the OH minus, because remember in water, you have hydrogen and hydroxide, because H2O really is, for acids and bases, you can think of H2O as two H's and an O, or you can think of it as an H plus and an OH minus. And in an acid base unit, it's probably more important to think of water as H plus and an OH minus. So in, at a pH of seven, when it's neutral, there's an equal amount of H plus and OH minus. H plus is for the acid, OH minus is for the base. When there's an equal number, it's neutral. So that's a pH of 7. When it's an acidic substance, the H plus concentration is greater than the OH minus. And when it's a basic solution, the OH minus is greater than the H plus. OK. You have to also know the unit changes. And there's a rule. Each change in the unit on the pH scale represents a tenfold difference in the hydrogen ion concentration. Now you're probably thinking, what is he talking about? That makes no sense. I'll explain it. It's very simple. You have your pH scale. The difference between 3 and 4, well, 3 is more acidic. How much more acidic? Well, it's a tenfold increase. F pH of 3 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 4. A pH of 2 is two tenfolds, which is 100. Oh, OK. pH of 2 is 100 times more acidic than a pH of 4. A pH of 1 is 1,000 times more acidic than a pH of 4. You just need to know each unit on a pH scale represents a tenfold change in the hydrogen ion or hydronium ion concentration. And that's all you need to know about the pH scale changes. And there are a lot of problems with them. Let's go to table M and worry, look at our indicators. Table M shows us five, actually shows us six indicators. When you're dealing with the table M, you look at the indicator. Approximate pH range for color change. So it lists the pro approximate pH changes. Anything below, so let's take methyl orange, for example. 
Methyl orange has a pH range for 3.2 to 4.4. And it changes from red to yellow. What that means is 3.2 or below changes to color red. 4.4 or higher changes to color yellow. And then somewhere in between 3.2 and 4.4 is some color in between red and yellow. So that's the pH changes. So if I, now, would methyl orange be able to tell you the difference between an acid and a base? No, because what if you had a, an acid at a pH of 5? Well, it would be yellow. Well, what would a, a base with a pH of 10 be? It would also be yellow. So the only substances that can really tell the difference between acids and bases are the pH change, are the, are the substances with a pH range with 7, the neutral. For example, bromthymol blue would be yellow in an acid and blue in a base. And that's how you read table M. And you can do, there are problems on table M that we can go over after when you click on the questions. That's table M. Just to refresh on table M quickly, a pH of 4. Let's say I had a substance with a pH of 4. Let me tell you what each substance would change. Methyl orange would be closer to yellow because the pH changes around 4.4. Bromthymol blue, pH of 4, well, it's below 6, it would be yellow. Phenolphthalein, pH of 4, would be colorless. Litmus, pH of 4, would be red because it's below 5.5. Bromcrestal green, at a pH of 4, would be somewhere between yellow and blue, probably closer to yellow, though. And thymol blue would be yellow because it's below 8. And that's how you tell table M. The next thing I have to talk to you about is a neutralization reaction. A neutralization I referred to before, but it's when you take an acid plus a base and you get a salt and a water. And it's actually a really simple double replacement reaction. So let me give you an example of a neutralization reaction just so it makes sense to you. Let's say I want to take an acid and a base. Well, let's just go to this table, table K, find two, let's do the top ones, HCl and NaOH. The top two acids, the top acid on table K and the top base on table L. So I would take HCl plus NaOH. Here's your acid and here's your base. Now, what did I say it forms? Salt and water. But it's just a simple double replacement reaction. If you need to go back to the concept on double replacement reaction, do that now. But this is how you do the double replacement. Positive goes with negative. Positive goes with negative. Remember that. So the positive, negative, positive, negative. H will go with OH. And I'm writing it over here for a reason. You'll see. And NA, positive goes first. Na goes with Cl, NaCl. So here you have your salt and your water. That's not how you spell water, so I'm just going to rewrite it. All right, great. That's a, that's a neutralization reaction. And notice the water is HOH, like I told you it could be. In acid-base units, you really want to think of water as HOH. And the regions can ask you simple neutralization. Just draw a neutralization of an acid and a base, and you get a salt and a water. And that's the bottom line with neutralization. Now, understanding neutralization will help you with probably the hardest topic in this lesson. And that is titration. What a titration problem does is a titration problem is when you have a substance where you want to determine the concentration. Now, concentration represents how much solute you have. In an acid, the concentration, the solute, is the H+. Plus. In a base, the concentration is the OH-. minus. A titration is determining the concentration. Now, when, when we did solutions, we talked about concentration in terms of molarity. That's what we're doing here. If you need more reference to molarity, go back to the concept on molarity and concentration. But titration is based, there's a mathematical formula in which you know the concentration of one, you want to find the concentration of the other. And in order to do it, there's a simple, simple 
equation. You see titration, you go right to table T. If you're lucky, it's right there. Table T shows titration. As you can see on the slide window, you see the titration formula. And I like to say it, ma va equals mubvub. I'm not trying to be funny. Ma va equals mubvub. Molarity of the acid times the volume of the acid equals the molarity of the base times the volume of the base. And when you do a titration problem, you're always going to know at least three of them, and they're going to ask to find the fourth. Let's do a problem. What is the molarity of an HCl solution? Oh, HCl, H starts with H, acid, good. If 20 milliliters of this acid, oh, that V is the volume, is needed to neutralize 10 milliliters of a 0.5 molar HC, uh, NaOH solution. Now, it's important to just refresh your memory. The per titration, the way it works, is it tries to get it neutral. So if you see the word neutralize or titration, you know you're dealing with a titration problem. Because the whole point is you want it to be neutralized, which is what, you get, what the result of a titration problem is. So in this problem, what is the molarity of an HCl solution of 20 milliliters, and you see that's the volume of the acid, of this solution is needed to neutralize 10 milliliters, volume of the base, of a 0.5 molar, molarity of the base, NaOH solution. Your equation just becomes 20x equals 10 times 0.5. And you get, you, do your, you, solve your, you solve the problem, do your algebra, and you get 0.25 molar. And using that molarity equation, ma va equals mubvub, to find the titration, you now know the molarity of the acid. And that's what you just found. Sometimes, though, the Regents gives you a titration setup. And this gets a little more tricky. This represents a burette. This is used in a titration setup. And you'll see on the slide window how to use a burette. What you're doing in a titration setup is you're adding either an acid to a base or a base to an acid. And remember, in titration, you want to neutralize it. So the end point of a titration is neutralization, which means a pH of 7. So which indicators, use a, which indicators would show a pH of 7? Well, bromthymol blue shows a color change at around 7 if you look at table M, because table M shows pH of 7. Litmus also shows a change in color at a pH of 7. And phenolphthalein, although it looks like it doesn't because it shows a pH range from 8.2 to 10, there's actually a really complicated explanation to why phenolphthalein is actually the best indicator to tell the neutralization. It actually changes colors very quickly. And we could talk more about this in the chat, but you just have to know that phenolphthalein shows a color change at a pH of 7. So this is how we do a titration setup. You have your burette, which I showed you, and, you label, and it's, it's a burette, and it's labeled a burette. And in this case, you're going to put the acid in the burette. So the acid is going to be poured from the burette into a beaker of a base. Now you see the liquid in the burette. It has an indicator level, a volume, an initial volume of 10 milliliters. We'll hold off on that for now. Now you have a beaker underneath it. In the beaker, you're going to put the base. But you know the volume of the base. The volume of the base, you're putting in 15 milliliters of the base. You also know the molarity of the base. So if you know the molarity of the base and the volume of the base, you know that you're going to have to find the molarity of the acid. So you see the liquid, uh, the volume in the, in, of the base in the beaker is 15 milliliters. And the concentration of the base, which is known, is 0 0.70 molarity, or molar solution. Now let's look at the burette readings for the acid. The initial volume you see starts at 10 milliliters. The final volume, well, we didn't add anything yet. Remember, we want to add the acid to the base to get it neutral. So what, what do we have to do? We have to put something in the base beaker. And what do we put in the beaker of the base? We put phenolphthalein. What color will it turn phenolphthalein? I mean, what color will phenolphthalein turn a base? It will turn it pink. What's going to happen is, it turns it pink, and you can see it, it's pink. Now you know you have a basic solution inside the beaker because you dropped phenolphthalein, and you only did two drops because that's all you need. 
Now you're going to start adding the acid to the base to hopefully get neutralization. And as you add, little drops may start to turn clear, but remember, that's because it's touching that small concentrated area. You want the whole beaker to turn clear, or else you don't know if it's neutral. The only way you know it's neutral is the point at which it turns neutral, which is pH of 7. So what will happen to the beaker of the, of the um, base that's pink when it turns neutral? It will actually completely turn clear. So you're going to keep dropping. You're going to keep dropping the liquid in. The burette's turned. And you're going to constantly see it get more and more clear, but not necessarily completely clear. Then when it gets close, you're going to stop the burette. And then you're going to add it drop by drop. And you're going to add it drop by drop, drop by drop, until it turns completely clear. Now it's completely clear. Well, let's see, how much acid did you use? Do we know the acid from the beginning? No, well, we don't know the amount of acid that we used because we have to go back to our, our chart. The chart showed that we started the volume of the beer at 10 milliliters and ended at 19.3. What's the volume used? Well, you have to figure it out. If you started at 10 milliliters and you went all the way down to 19.3, the volume that was used was 9.3 milliliters. And sometimes the Regents question will simply ask, what's the volume used given this titration information? But you know the volume used was 9.3 milliliters. Now, you know the volume of the acid. You still don't know the molarity of the acid. You know the volume of the base because you knew that from the beginning, and you knew the molarity of the base from the beginning. Now you put it into your, symbol, your simple ma va mubvub problem, and you get molarity of the acid times 9.3, which is the volume of the acid, equals 15, which is the volume of the base, times 0.7, which is the molarity of the base. And you do your whole problem, and you get, you do your algebra, and you get 1.129 molar, or 1.1 molar, acid solution, solution, or HCl. So now you've figured out, using titration data, what the molarity of the acid was. And you could add the base to the acid, you could add the acid to the base. What's important though is you know the endpoint of a titration is to get it to neutral. So you want to see that color change. And with titration, what we usually do in titration problems is we usually do multiple trials. We don't just do it once and figure out the molarity because maybe there's human error. Maybe we made a mistake. So what we do is we do it once, twice, three times, four times, five times, and then we take the average of all those trials and then we can determine the molarity of the substance we need. I know that was a little long and I know that was a, little, a hard, hard problem on molarity with titration, but you need to know how to do it. Now I hope you learned a lot about acids and bases and even a little bit about salts. Now. What I want you to do, like I always want you to do, is I want you to go over all the questions on acid bases. All the questions that relate to this lesson, I want you to go over them. I want you to do the, listen to the video explanations, whether you get it right or wrong, because that's the best way to learn. And if you still have questions, I want you to come to the live chat and you can ask your Regents tutor anything you want to know. And go over your review sheets. If you do all those things, you'll be set. I hope you learned something.